Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're in week six talking about liquid chromatography. And in this lecture, we're going to be really getting into the chemistry of the column and the mobile phase. And if there's one idea from this lecture I want you to take home, is that in liquid chromatography, the mobile phase all of a sudden is a really, really important part of the chemistry of the separation. So this is my sort of sketch of what goes on in a chromatography column at a sort of chemical level. You have some silica bonded to that silica through siloxane bonds are a variety of different organic functionalities that you've defined or you've bought from the company. In this case, you'll see a bunch of methyls and hexanes, pretty hydrophobic column. As we're going to learn, this is a reversed phase column. And you also see some analytes going by, some isopropanol and some water, which are part of the mobile phase. There are three types of interactions that matter. First, it's the interaction of this analyte with the surface of the silica column, which in this case is hydrophobic. So it's an analyte column interaction. The analyte itself has to be soluble in the mobile phase, which in this case is propanol water. And finally, the nature of the mobile phase stationary phase interaction. So those three interactions, the analyte and the mobile phase, got to make it soluble. That's all you have to worry about. The second is the analyte with the stationary phase, which is a lot like gas chromatography. How much interaction do you have with column material chemically? But finally, the interaction of the mobile phase with the stationary phase. So let's start off talking about the familiar bit, which is how the analyte interacts with the stationary phase. Well, here's an example from your reading on xanthines and chocolate. And what you're looking at is the separation of four xanthines. I won't go through what the chemical structures are. I'm going to leave that to you on four different columns. And the main take home message from this data is to get you to realize that under very similar conditions, you get, first of all, very different retention times. So we can deduce from the fact that our molecules came out later on the phenyl column that we probably have some aromatic character. So when we load up that column surface with some phenyls and some aromatic aromaticity, then our analyte will actually partition more, spend more time on the, mo on the stationary phase, and of course, come out later. You'll notice also that the separation efficiency between one and two is very poor on the cyano column. Again, suggesting something about the nature of those molecules. So by looking at this kind of data and asking yourself, why do one and two come out the same on the cyano column? Three and four are different, maybe because they have more heteroatom character, or for example, some carbonyl functionalities. Two and three came out similarly on this bonus column, which if you're lucky, the company will tell you something about the chemistry. And so part of the thinking about column selection is to think through how can you separate your particular set of molecules. So this is kind of a summary of the types of functionalities you get. They're remarkably similar to gas chromatography because a lot of that siloxane chemistry is the same. So you can have very long chain greasy alkanes, C18, C8, C4. They're going to be really standard go-to columns for HPLC, probably one of the first columns you might run. You can also buy columns that have more phenyl character, more cyano character. You can also start to make normal phase columns or columns that are polar. Those may have amino functionalities. They may just be bare silica. They're very problematic columns to run with, however. And so, as I'll argue later, you typically see reversed phase columns that have a lot more hydrophobic character being the basis of HPLC separations. Let's do one more example of the role of the column in separations. And what I want you to do is maybe stop the tape and take a look at the two chromatograms on the bottom and decide what's different between the left one and the right one. So, and then, if you can figure out what's different, Try to look at the chemical structures and rationalize, well, why are they different? OK, so if you check these two things out, what you're first going to notice is that on the left one with the phenyl set example, you're nicely separating 5 and 6, whereas on the C18 silica, 5 and 6 are overlapping. And if you go up to this chemical model, you can see that in these two systems, you actually have a difference of a double bond. So the narogenin doesn't have doesn't have a double bond, and the apigenin does. And sure enough, when you're running on the phenyl silica, the narogenin comes out a little bit later than the apigenin. And what that tells you is that you can separate something about these two based on their aromaticity. And likewise, on the C18 silica, there's really very little difference in hydrophobicity, which is really the only selectivity factor you get with C18. So in any case, that's an example of thinking through how does the chemistry of the 
molecules impact their retention times, and in some cases, your ability to resolve them. So in this case, you resolved the peaks not by changing the peak widths, but by changing the retention times they come out at, both of which are fine strategies to adopt. If you want to have some fun, try to go through and figure out why all of, the, why all of these molecules come out in the order they do. Okay, so we've talked about Number one, the three interactions, the analyte and the mobile phase has to be soluble. That's all you need, it's got to be soluble. Can't phase separate, no salad dressing in a liquid chromatography column. It has to be very homogeneously mixed. The second thing is the analyte to the stationary phase interactions, which are governed very much by the same sets of rules we learned for gas chromatography. If you have aromatic analytes, they're going to interact differently than analytes without aromaticity if your column has aromaticity character to it. But the thing that makes LC really different is the fact that the mobile phase all of a sudden really matters. It's not just pushing analytes through the system. It plays a powerful role in the selectivity and the speed of the separation. And here's why. So the reason is that you can think of the mobile phase as a kind of blanket. And it can blanket the column. And if it's a lot like the column, it blocks the column. It says to the analytes going by, I don't want you to be part of my party. I'm interacting with this column. And it actually keeps the analytes from partitioning into the column. On the other hand, if the mobile phase is very different from the column, it won't do that. So a strong eluent, eluent, remember, is a term for the mobile phase, is going to be very similar chemically to the column whereas a weak eluent is going to be dissimilar. And you don't really get into the fine details of aromaticity and heteroatoms here. The primary way things are different or similar is simply polarity. So you can have nonpolar columns with nonpolar solvents. That would be a very strong eluent. In fact, so strong you may completely block the column from any interactions, which is not what you want. Likewise, for a really polar column, you wouldn't run one water because no analyte would ever have a chance of even seeing the column. So you've got to sort of fine tune the composition and choice of the mobile phase to allow for just the right kind of interactions. Keeping in mind that a strong eluent is going to block interactions and a weak eluent, eluent might promote them. So by changing that mobile phase, you're going to be able to change the retention time of different analytes in the system. Okay, so here's a visual to sort of leave you with in this lecture. We'll talk about this more in the next mini lecture. It's really hard when you start to put all these concepts together for liquid chromatography, so I like to give you some maybe visuals to stick with you. A strong eluent, a strong mobile phase, is one that basically says, no, you're not going to interact with my column. So these analytes are going to zoom right down the system. They're not going to see the column because you have such a strong eluent mobile phase that it blocks those partitions. You know, a weak eluent will be, well, okay, I'll share my mobile phase. That means the analytes are going to have a lot of interactions with the stationary phase, excuse me. And in those interactions, it will slow them down, and they're going to come out a lot later. So let's see an example of that. So here's an interesting example where the column is what's called a reversed phase or think of it as a nonpolar column. So it's a column that's got a lot of hydrophobic character, kind of like the drawing at the beginning of this lecture. And what you're doing in this series of chromatograms is you're changing the solvent composition. And the solvent, B, is acetonitrile, and the other solvent is water. So a good way of thinking about 90% B is that it's got very little water. It's not very polar. But as we go to 80%, 70%, 60%, we're adding more and more and more water. We're making the mobile phase more polar. So we're adding water to the acetonitrile, and we're getting a more polar mobile phase. Now, what does that mean for the strength? Well, remember, this is a nonpolar column. So acetonitrile is more nonpolar than water. Water is as polar as you can get. So that acetonitrile is really blocking the column. It's strong. It's going to interact with a nonpolar column to some extent. And it's going to be a strong eluent. Whereas as we add water, it's going to make it different from the column. It's going to be weaker. So on the left over here, the strong eluent, a lot of nonpolar character against a nonpolar column, you'll notice the peaks all come out right on top of each other. And they're not well separated. And they come out fast. And that's because you got a strong eluent saying, no, you're not going to interact with the column. Now, as you put more water in, you weaken that eluent. And it starts to allow for analyte interactions. They spread out. 
they get much longer. In fact, if you go to 30% acetonitrile, it's almost pure water, look at this. This last peak comes out almost in 46 minutes. It is a very weak eluent when it's only 30% acetonitrile. And so in this case, you can sort of see that as you make the mobile phase more unlike the stationary phase, you get much, much longer retention times. And in fact, it's exquisitely sensitive. We went from a separation where everything is piled on top of each other, only took five minutes, to a kind of decent separation, to a really long separation. And so you can easily see that the choice of mobile phase is going to be a very powerful one. And I might ask you, what's wrong with this separation? You did pull out all your peaks, but you had to wait 46 minutes. So one of the things we're going to be doing in the next lecture is seeing how by using gradient dilution, you can change the strength. You can actually make it stronger at the end, so you start to push out and make those long times even shorter. So in any case, I hope what you've gotten from this lecture is that the interaction between the amylate and the column is important, just like it was in gas chromatography. And you can understand retention times by looking at that chemistry. But equally important is the mobile phase. And if you have a strong mobile phase that interacts with your column because it has similar polarity, it's going to block those sites for interaction, and your stuff's going to zoom through. You'll have poor selectivity, but really fast separation. Thanks so much. See you next time.